Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles Podcast. I'm also the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. Really excited about today. It's titled Meet the Investor, Forbes Magazine called the new Benjamin Graham. And if you don't know who Benjamin Graham is, shame on you, the godfather of investing, specifically value investing, and the person that who Warren Buffett most looked up to. That should probably say it all. Our featured guest today is Vitali Katzenelson, and I'm really excited to have Vitali on. As I mentioned to him, and I just cold reached out to him about two weeks ago, I've been following him in his newsletter for about two or three years now. He's absolutely one of my favorite writers, and I'm always interested to how great investors think, how they make decisions, and what they're, what they're doing in today's topsy-turvy world. So on that note, Vitali, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure, Angel. Thank you. And I love how you shame the people right away. Like <laughs> <laughs> I try. Uh, so let's get right to it. What's your process for designing a value-based portfolio? Uh, like ideas, screening, research, analyst, investment committees, walk us through that process. So this is how I approach our process. So let me give you some context. Most of our clients are high net worth individuals. A lot of them, I manage all their money. So they are not gonna make any more money ever again. So when they come to me, they say, Vitaly, here's my life savings, don't screw it up. So when we build a portfolio, I want this portfolio basically withstand anything that global my, you know, micro you know, uh, economy um, will throw at it. So uh, what I try to do, I, find, I try to build it with a basically, and we, you know, we focus on stocks here. So I try to uh, build a full of, of companies that can withstand anything uh, you know, happening globally. And uh, kind of like, uh, maybe one way to put it is a full lot of cockroaches, you know, and then the feature of a cockroach, it kind of survives anything. <laughs> or, or if you don't like cockroach, maybe like a Twinkie, like, you know, <laughs> I've been told Twinkie can survive uh, a yeah, nuclear ho holocaust. So anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, that's, but, but that's, that's, that's where we start. And basically we, you know, our process has several phases. We do, you know, you know, there's a, search phase, there is a analysis phase, then if you bought it, then it becomes, a, there is a monitoring phase, and then and then we, if we sell, then it starts all over again. But that's, that is kind of the, the sequence we go through. And how many positions would you on average have in a portfolio? So it's a good question. So if you and I talked a year ago, I would have said probably 20 to 25 positions. During the pandemic, um, we switched, we increased number of positions and we did this for a good reason. And I think during the, um, this was the first time in the last hundred years we faced the pandemic. And I felt that there were so many underwater risks that I did not, I may not see, I may only see it in the hindsight that we decided. And, and at the time also, like I'm talking about, you know, especially March, April, May, March, April, May, there were so many opportunities available that I was able to increase number of positions and still without sacrificing much return, but at the same time, reducing risk. So now probably we are closer to 35 positions. Yeah, and no, that's interesting. So what I would take a look at that is say, arguably, especially with value investors that sometimes could be more concentrated by diversifying, you may be dampening returns, but you feel in today's uh, very unique world uh, that you wanted to have more diversity in your holdings to hedge against certain risk and monitor those companies very closely. Yeah, so they, so they, I think the, you, so normally you would have been right about dampening returns. I felt that in, uh, during the pandemic, because there was a universal sell-off, I would actually be reducing risk without dampening returns. Let me give you an example. Um, we bought investment firms. Uh, we bought money managers, you know, like investment for investment firms, 
during the uh, during the pandemic. They were all down six to seventy percent. So in the past, we would have bought one firm and we would have put five percent position. It would have been let's say five or four or five percent position. Mm -hmm. We ended up buying three, but we made them as a five percent position. So in the, in the, in the so the we bought them as a basket basically. And our rationale was, if one of these companies has this risk that we didn't think of, that's you know then it's gonna, you know then it's a, it's if it blows up, it's not gonna it's not gonna kill us. That was kind of the yeah. And people perceive this next question differently. And I don't want to give you any guidance. You'll just answer how you feel is applicable, if any at all. Do you follow what some would describe as a mental model, a specific approach? I, 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 I am a huge believer in mental models because mental models basically allow you to create these frameworks mm -hmm. which allow you to analyze or see uh, deal with a uh, with uh, deal with complex situations like the like one mental model I I know you want to talk about and so let's talk about it it's the uh, 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 the Fisher random chess stock market but but, that, that, but to me that that is a mental model right and that question of diversification fits perfectly into that mental model right so so let's talk about it so there is a like I was born in Russia, so kind of uh, chess is in my kind of DNA. Where in Russia, chess is the is what uh, I would argue hockey is for Canadians or something. I don't know. But uh, so you know, when you think about traditional chess, you basically have three phases of the game. You have uh, openings. You have openings. And uh, let me. Um, let me kill my uh, phone. Um, you, uh, you have openings, you have mid game, and then you have end game. So most chess players, you know, that are serious about chess, spend a lot of time on study openings because number of possible openings is fairly discreet. There's there are only so uh, there's only so many openings that are there out there. Um, so. Uh, uh, let me just put my phone on do not disturb so it's you know nobody calls me again. Okay, I'll do this. All right. So um, so there because there are only so many openings out there. So when a player when you start playing chess, and in the opening section, you, you know, you spend very little time thinking because you already thought through all of the scenarios before, right? Now, and then when it comes to mid-game, this is where a number of uh, number of uh, possible moves is infinite, almost infinite. So this is where you spend a lot of your energy thinking about. Okay, now think about what happened. Oh, now let's talk about Fisher random chess for a second. So Bobby Fisher, the world champion, I guess he probably got bored with traditional chess. So he kind of co-created his own version of chess and which was, it was named after him where the rules are the same except one thing. Every single game, the first row, uh, the first file of pieces is randomized. So the, the queen, instead of being in the middle, may end up being on the left or on the right, or far left or far right. So imagine like you look at the board every single game and the pawns are where they, you know, where they were before, but all the other pieces are in very different locations. So you so can't therefore, memorize opening moves. So you can't memorize opening moves. So the, if you think about for, think about this for a second. So Think of openings in a traditional chess as a mental model. Each opening is its own mental model. So you can say, okay, if this guy does this, I'm gonna bring my mental model and that's what I'm gonna do. You can't bring your old mental models to the Fisher random chess openings, right? Because it's, you've never seen this before. And I would argue the pandemic was that. The, <laughs> yes. the, the, the pandem because you could not, like pandemic basically, having mental models was actually a bit dangerous because you you never played this game before. Like, you know, you, you know what happened you know, the last pandemic we had was hundred years ago, which was a different world, right? So, and uh, so this is, this is why I, every single, single decision I made, I tried to make sure that the mental models of the past are, not necessarily hurting me because 
you know, and so every single move I made in the portfolio, I made sure that, um, you know, like in the, like, like in the, the, like in the, the example was like me increasing the number of positions was a defensive move just for that reason. So, um, but that's, so they, so I use, so they, in the, you know, so I use mental models all the time. And uh, I think they are important tools. And Charlie Munger, you know, Warren Buffett's right hand man, is a huge fan of mental models as well, by the way. So, yes. For sure. And I suppose my next question is also broad, but I'll try to narrow it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm always interested to know how smart people, which you certainly are, especially as an investor, how you make decisions. And maybe to, to help out a little bit, do you follow certain macro numbers and factors? And if so, why? So let me give you the, my mental model on that. How's that? Um, <laughs> it's perfect timing. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I think the... Uh, so, so that, like, I'm going to use Warren Buffett as an example. So Warren Buffett, you know, a long time ago said that if he did not know what, you know, he doesn't care what Federal Reserve will do in the next six months. So I think while the investors got a clue from, you know, got a cue from this, that what happens in the macro environment doesn't matter. Okay. And I think they were wrong because Warren Buffett at the same time uh, made investments based on a long-term weakening of the dollar. And I remember he even wrote an article for Fortune magazine in the late 90s about this. So what Warren Buffett was saying is that he doesn't pay attention to the short-term micro trend, uh, macro trends. Okay, so he doesn't care what the, the next unemployment number is not as important to him as if the big events that's happening that have a uh, landscape changing events that happen in the macro environment. So my analogy would be, so you could be either a weatherman or climatologist. Okay, a weatherman spends a lot of time thinking about tomorrow's weather, but the problem is that consumes a huge amount of energy and it has a very short-term shelf life. Yesterday's weather is irrelevant today, okay? So at the same time, looking at the big uh, big uh, uh, climate changing events, you know, it has a, you know, it's a, things may not necessarily happen today, but may happen in the next 10 years. That actually, those trends are a lot more important. So I would argue you want to be, you don't really want to be a weatherman, but climatologist instead. So I, so that's, and that's how I look at macro picture. So I look at the, I, tr I, I try to find big uh, risks, and benefits of what's happening in the global macro. And that's how I, and then I applied this to, and then I apply this to our, you know, kind of, then I integrate this into our kind of stack selection process. And it's probably more of a, a macro expert question, but I, I want to dig into that a little bit. So do you look at certain factors like the 10 year yield on treasuries? Do you look at the dollar? Do you look at oil? Those would probably be a big three, even though what you do is specific to value investing in equities. Do you still feel that they intertwine? Uh, yeah, I probably spend the least amount of time thinking about that, especially in the short run, you know, but I am, you know, but I, but I am puzzled where the oil is going to be in the long run. So I spent, I spent time, you know, but I spent, so I spent time thinking about it. And uh, so, you know, I've done a lot of that thinking and uh, uh, I think about the, you know, so I think about where the, you know, I'm a lot of times I arrive to the conclusion, you know, and some things you mentioned, like, I don't know. And that's a, that's an important, that's a, by the way, that's an important mental model to have because it's a great one. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because I think the. Uh, let me give you one example. Um, are we going to have inflation or deflation going forward? That's one of the questions you probably get asked me, and and I'll tell you my answer is going to be I don't I don't know. Okay, and that answer is important. Here's why. If you are deflationist, if you are certain that we're going to have deflation, you're going to structure your portfolio in a certain way. If you're an inflationist, you're gonna do it, you know, you can, you're gonna do it differently. If you are a deflationist and you're wrong, you're gonna blow up. And so if you are an inflationist, it's almost like the my analogy would be the worst thing that could 
ever happened to you as a poker player when you have a second best hand? <laughs> because when you're second best hand, you are sure you're going to be right. You're going to, you know, and you're going to win, right? And you're going to go all in and then your card is second best and there is no second best, you know, and you lose. So, so therefore, a lot of, you know, a lot of times what's going to happen is I'm going to spend a lot of time doing an uh, analysis and I'll come to the, I don't know solution. I, I don't know uh, uh, conclusion. And then I'm going to make, I'm going to structure portfolio accordingly that if either scenario plays out, I'm going to come out okay. And that's, and then, so, so, so that's, so that's kind of, that's how I look, you know, and that's, and that's basically how I look at a lot of macro equations, you know. Excellent. Uh, what is value investing to you? What does that mean? So I think value investing is misunderstood what value investing is. So most people read Benjamin Graham's Intelligent Investor and basically arrive to a conclusion that value investing is buying back, you know, is buying cheap stocks, statistically cheap stocks. It's almost like my argument would be, it's like going to, uh, it's like reading 10 commandments and the only thing getting out of that is how to count to 10, right? It's a, if when people do this, they miss the bigger picture of what value investing is, what Ben Graham was trying to communicate in the intelligent investor. Value investing is basically a philosophical framework or an investing framework uh, where, where, and I'm gonna list some of the factors. I call them the six commandments of value investing, but it's basically, you look at analyzing, uh, you look at, uh, at stocks, not just pieces of paper or electronic you know, bytes, but as businesses where the stock market volatility is, uh, you know, is there to serve you, you know, where you look at risk, not as volatility, but as permanent loss of capital, where, um, where when every time you make an investment, you, you make a room that you're not going to be right, you know, that you're, you're not going to be right. So you need margin of safety. So those are the, by the way, just for your readers. And this is a, I, I wrote this, like I wrote a huge, this I have, I don't know, 20 page uh, paper on this, on the, on the value investing. And if you go to sixcommandments.com, you can just download it there. It's, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's great. Paper. I read it and was going to bring that up later. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's so, so yeah, but, but that's what value investing is to me. It's a, it's not about buying stocks at six times earnings. Because if that's that's all it needed, then my my seven year old daughter could do this, yeah. Because all you need is a you know first grade math, but it's a lot more than that, and I think that's most people miss that. I completely agree, and I hate to pigeonhole it in that definition P/E ratios. We're going to get into some of that a little later, but I do think a good follow up question from my side is: Aren't all truly good investments? Shouldn't they be value investments? Which is why I don't like to pigeonhole it by the term growth or value. That's just me. I, I think it's a, good, it's a good, great point. I just wrote an essay that I haven't published yet where I, call, uh, I go after both growth and value demagogues because, and I make, and, I'm, and, I, and the point I'm stressing in that essay is that growth is part of value. Like the the like if you look at the formula, if you look at the return for a stock in the long run, if you look at the just uh, if you just look at price of appreciation of any stock, and this is a very simple mathematical formula, the reason stock price goes up in the long run because of two reasons, or combination of them: price to earnings expansion and earnings growth. So earnings growth is part of value framework. Okay, so if you look at Microsoft and you say, if you know, why, the, why, did, why did the Microsoft stock did not go anywhere from 2000 to, I don't know, 2015 or something or 2013 is because its earnings were growing, but price earnings was declining. So, and why did the stock go up a lot from, from then forward? Because earnings P stopped declining, started to go up and earnings growth. So earning uh, growth is part of value. Yeah, great point. And I'm going to go back to my audience knows I do like to ask about games. I'm not quite finished with chess yet. So chess is great. Your Russian heritage, it's ingrained in you, like you said. 
And Fisher Random Chess takes away memorizing opening moves that makes it more realistic. But when it comes to games, chess, you have equal information with your competitor. Mm -hmm. You are limited in terms of what you could do. Whereas poker involves luck, just like real life. And you have incomplete information. I guess the bigger picture I'm getting to is how do you make decisions with incomplete information? Yet you have to. So that's that's a, that's a great point. Uh, so a couple of things. So the I love the poker analogy because um, in poker, your decisions in the short run are completely random. Like the 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 there is a there is very little connection between decision and outcome. Okay, because a lot there's a lot of randomness. In the long run, if you have a process, if you have a process where the odds in the process are in your favor, then you will reap the rewards of that process. And though in any time in the short run, you may have the best process. You can be making every, uh, you can make a decision, you can be making right decisions and it's not gonna matter. So that's, a, that's, uh, that's point number one. Point number two, to answer your question, you're never gonna have complete information. And so what you try to do is, this is where the margin of safety comes in to some degree, because the margin of safety is there to protect you for the incomplete information, for where you say, I don't know how this, this is gonna work out, but if this works out horribly, I'm, you know, there is, you know, I'm, I'm paying, I'm buying stuff cheap enough that I'm still going to be okay. So when we, we when, when we analyze companies, we basically come up with a kind of a three scenarios: kind of a bear case, you know, kind of bear case, middle case, and bull case. And what we try to do, we value the company based on a kind of a middle of the road case, but we try to buy it below bear case. So if things don't work out, we don't lose money. So no, that's, those are very that's, good points. Yeah. Uh, it's a random question, pardon the pun on random Fisher or Fisher random chess. Uh, <laughs> this happens here in the US, probably more so with penny stocks, but this absolutely happens around the world, let's be honest. Unfortunately, there are frauds out there in public companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I think it's more common in certain other exchanges. We won't be overly granular and go into detail about that. That's a separate subject. But that also helps to cover your basis, not just looking at the management team, its track record mm -hmm. and getting a feel for your experiences. But again, I go back to if your exposure is one or 2% of the portfolio, it's relatively nominal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what, I'm sorry, what, 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 what's the question though? The, what's, what's, what's the I mean, question? Do you have some awareness that they're, you know, not every company is gonna be 100% direct and honest on the books that are reported, especially certain international companies. Yes. So the we, for instance, we don't own any companies in China, and I think that's what good reason. To avoid. Yeah. <laughs> that would be no, one but, of but, but I think that for for uh, for, for that reason, yeah, for, uh, for that reason, I uh, um, like I one way to avoid some of the fraud, not all of it, is for looking for simplicity. When something becomes very complex, that's where you hide your fraud, right? Because it's a lot more difficult to hide, you know, to fright, you know, to hide fraud in something that is extremely simple and transparent. So, but I kind of try to. I like to pick problems that require low IQ, because I know that those then those problems will never or outmatch me, you know. So, so whenever, whenever you see a company that's very complex. I, you know, that's, there's high probability for fraud. And then that's how I try to avoid it. I think you partially answered my next question, but I'll dive a little deeper. Probably has to do with admitting when you're wrong, having a beginner's mindset and having multiple talented people that will look at a trade or an investment. So you get different opinions, but basically, I mean, you've been successful for a number of years. How do you avoid it's human nature, certain biases and confirmation bias? So um, one of my favorite books um, is uh, it's about Jesse Livermore. Uh, yeah, uh, a name. legend. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's a legend. Yeah. Yes. And uh, and I'm going blank with the name. Something about uh, reminiscences of stock operator mm -hmm. or stock speculator. I forget the you know. And 
in like I remember there was a, this one phrase that stuck with me. He had a, and the reason I like this book because he was a trader. I'm an investor. So what? What? what you know? Why does it? Why is this book important? Well, I think it's important because it's probably the first book that addresses the. Uh, behavioral investing, uh, the behavioral aspect of investing or trading for that matter. It doesn't matter from this perspective. But anyway, in this book, he talked about how he was paralyzed because he was so successful. You know, he had this train of success and he was, he was afraid that the success is impacting his judgment. And so I try to, I think in uh, being self-aware and being aware of your biases is extremely, extremely important. And then what, you, what I try to do in my process is put this kind of guardrails that would protect me against my own psyche. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. When we uh, decide how much to invest in each company, we have a separate process that, uh, that basically, which is almost uh, like, uh, very quantitative process that basically helps us to uh, to limit position size. So it's because the problem is, they have, you know, when you, when you do investment research, you fall in love with the company and you stop seeing risks, and then you your your position size may become too big. Right. So we actually we have a separate process for position sizing, and therefore, because when we you know the and the position size is based on two factors really based on company's quality and valuation. And for instance, if company has, like when we look at quality, we look at you know, company's management, we look at the balance sheet, we look at competitive advantages, and we have a checklist we go through. And based on this checklist, we determine company's quality. And, that, and, and, I, and I know that checklist exists to protect me against myself. And that's how we determine the company's position size the position size that stock is going to be, you know, is going to have an upper portfolio. A pinch off topic, but I always want to mm. change our perspective and come back to certain things, whether personal or business, do you journal? Do you practice a gratitude journal? And does it help you realize your emotions and how you make decisions? So this is like, well, first of all, let, let's, let's, I write about two hours a day, every single day. I wake up depending on the time of the year, but you know, somewhere between 4.30, 5 o'clock, between 4 and 5 o'clock every day. And I write for about two hours a day. So unfortunately, a lot of times that competes with my journaling, but that is something I'm absolutely trying to do. And like, this is something like, this is like, if I had any, you know, like this would be my new year 2021 resolution to journal more, more. And I, I've done this for a while, I, you know, and I, one mistake I have made, I've been journaling right before the pandemic and during the pandemic, because we start to work crazy hours and it's just disrupted my normal rhythm. I stopped journaling and I wish I did because I would like to go back to April 5th or whatever that, you know, uh, <laughs> right. and, and to see what I was thinking. So this is one of those things where I'm a hypocrite because I say, I think everybody should journal, including myself. <laughs> so, but yeah, but yeah, I think, I think I, you know, this is one of the things I'm going to, I'm going to start doing in 2021 again. I mean, you're probably going to say because the math or numbers don't make sense anymore, but I would like to dig into that. But the broader question is what would cause you to change your mind on a given position? You may be very bullish and then change your mind or very bearish and change your mind. What do you look at? What are key factors that you follow? Well, so they, it's, that's actually, so they, when, when, we, when we buy a company, um, we have a set of assumptions. And then as time goes by, those set of assumptions get violated, you know, get changed. And then we start to question, uh, you know, and, uh, and then the fair, you know, we, we have a certain you know, value for the fair value. And as we question the fair value, then we will change our mind. Yeah, no, that's true. And that's looking at, you know, your charting and your numbers and your 
that does bring my next question. When I talk to amazing investors, probably the two most common answers I hear, you know, what would you do to train someone to be a great investor? Or what are the two core factors? By far the most common I hear are discipline and understanding human behavior and psychology. What would it be to you? I think that person number one has to have this uh, burning desire to be an investor. It's not like, you know, I see, I see people in my industry that they come into this industry because of money, but they might have been, they would, they would have been something else, you know, you know, you know, they, you know, they could be doing something else. And I think, um, like, uh, there was a, there was a, I forget there was this bus, I forget the name of the guy, but he, he was this bas basketball coach who said, "You can't, you I can't, you can't teach height in the basketball." And I think in investing, you if you somebody has a passion, you know, like when when you could, when, when you investor, you compete against other people who are like like people like Warren Buffett who <laughs> spend 15, 20, you know, fifteen hours a day dedicated to that. Not because not, not not because he had a huge desire to be rich, I think he just loved the game. So yeah, I think I think you know that love of the game has to be prerequisite, and then you know then discipline, human behavior, all these other factors, are, you know you build on top of that. You know, but I think the love of the game is probably number one. In fact, I'll give an example. When I when we were looking for an analyst for IMA, I set the bar incredibly high. In a sense, somebody to apply, and I'm gonna, uh, they had to write an essay why I would be making the, you know, the worst mistake of my life and I hired them. I had asked him to provide me a list of books they read over last, <laughs> over last year, um, write about people who had a, like, it was a huge laundry list of things they had to do. And I didn't even care if, like, to read what they wrote. I mean, it was interesting to read it, but to me, it was, I, you know, I really, if person really wanted to work here, if this was not just another place they sent a resume, then that person would go through all the hoops. And because then I would see that the person has kind of the love for the game and would really wants to work for my firm. And that's ended up, ended up, ended up being the easiest decision ever made. Um, you know, uh, so hiring the person for that because out of 50 people, I only, you know, I only had to interview seven. Uh, try to think how I could phrase my next question. I suppose you could say during the pandemic, unlike most of the past 10 years, when being passive, I guess, net of taxes and fees for many has worked, worked well, now appears to be more of an active, quote unquote, picker's market. But I look at the S&P 500, there's a lot of companies not doing well, obviously. Why would I want to buy into a basket where a lot, a lot, not a couple, a lot of companies aren't doing well. But I guess the converse of that, and this must be a challenge for a value investor, look at what's doing well. There are high tech growth centric companies, the FANG, Microsoft, Tesla. Uh, is this a good or a bad time? And again, I hate to pigeonhole the word value because mm -hmm. you may look at a growth company and look at it differently than simply bifurcating it growth and value. Yeah, so they, so they, it's a good, it's a good, it's a very good question. Um, if you look at the kind of overall market today, the the, the kind of the economy, like the um, the dispersion of valuation, and I'm gonna use these words carefully between slow growth companies and fast growth companies, <laughs> uh, you know the dispersion between the valuations is basically approaching insanity. Um, because what happens if the company is growing, then investors are basically saying price doesn't matter. And that's what you see. Like, and this is, you know, and this, uh, and this actually touches on a lot of companies. Like let's speak Tesla, let's speak Tesla as an example. I own two Tesla cars and we just bought a second one and I absolutely love the product. I wrote a tiny book on it, you know, on, on Tesla, where I basically argued mm -hmm. that this company, this is probably one of the most important companies, you know, that developed, you know, this, you know, the Tesla electric car is probably the second most important product since iPhone. 
the iPhone would be number one. And the reason it is important because that's like accelerated the future. It's basically brought an electric car to us, which would have come eventually probably 10, 20 years sooner. And I think this is very good for society. However, the Tesla stock went up eight, you know, eight or tenfold. You know, it depends when you look. Uh, and even though, and, to, and basically, if you look at Tesla's valuation, it basically uh, assumes that time has no value. Let me explain what I mean by this. In Star Trek, there is this concept of, um, uh, uh, and I'm going. Um, when you go, uh, when when you had a uh, spaceship going from one quantum to another, uh, was I'm, it like warp speed? No, not warp warp speed. Um, I'm going blank on the name. But basically, when they when they when they when the space folds, and you're able to go from one quantum to another, and suddenly, you know, so that's a uh, I'm going blank on the name now. But anyway, so basically, if you, investors looking at Tesla today for Tesla to go from producing half a million cars to 10 million cars would require, first of all, significant amount of, amount of time, but a hundreds of billion dollars of investments. And the stock market assuming today that this, you know, that, you know, that this is gonna happen tomorrow, it's discounts as the future already happened. And it ignores the cost of, you know, company raising hundreds of billion dollars of money over the long term. So he, and here's my punchline. In 1999, the, the price of Qualcomm, which was, you know, went, went up 20X, 20 fold. It went from $4 to 80 in, within, in, in the one year. And I would argue Qualcomm is one of the best businesses ever. It's a phenomenal business. And Qualcomm was positioned properly right in the epicenter of growth of internet and mobile. Perfect, okay. Here's the, here's the punchline. If you bought Qualcomm in 99, Qualcomm's revenues went up after that 5X. Well, the next 15 years, it went up five, five-fold. But the stock price has, you know, first of all, in 2001, it declined 80%. And then it took you 15 years to come to the level where you were in 1999. I would argue, Tesla is not as good of a business as Qualcomm because Qualcomm just collect, you know, just you know, every time you buy a cell phone, Qualcomm makes five dollars or ten dollars. They just collect royalty. It's a Qualcomm is a better, less capital intensive business. And I would argue that today's stock price for companies like Tesla, and there's a lot of those companies in SP, uh, they're so expensive that it's gonna, you know, that the valuation discounts, uh, you know, discounts years and years of success. And when they are successful, you're still not going to make money. Uh, yeah. I mean, those are very interesting points. And I know how you feel about Tesla. And logically, as you're, you know, mentioning your example on that, it does make sense. It's just some things are, and yes, I'm long, I guess you could say in Tesla, it's worked out pretty well the last year. Doesn't mean that will work that way forever. I think Elon Musk is like the most amazing entrepreneur. I'm glad he's in America and doing hopefully great things here and around the world. But I look at Tesla and it's complicated. Of course it is. It's a climate change company to me an energy company, a tech company. Oh, oh yeah, it happens to also be a car company. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, you look at the P ratios and the math and it does leave you scratching your head. But uh, I don't know. And again, I limit my position. So if it goes drastically down, it still makes up a relatively modest part of my portfolio. I just don't know if that's a person or a company that I want to bet against right now. A lot of the short people have gotten crushed doing that. Oh, actually, so, 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 so the word I was looking for is a wormhole. So they uh, yes, like, yes just, that's so, it. so they so they, they I would call it the temporal the Tesla stock discounts a temporal wormhole basically as time doesn't exist. So the so this let's, let's make it clear. Just let me make a few points. First of all, I'm not saying you should be short in Tesla, but my, I'm using Tesla as an example because Tesla is trading. Like, look at the price earnings of Tesla is probably irrelevant because like a you know, but if you look at price to price to sales for Tesla. It's a 20, it's like, it's probably 22, 25 times sales. So, and uh, also the market capitalization of Tesla is greater than, you know, than all the other companies combined. So there is a, but, it, but the, the, and I don't want to make this conversation about Tesla really. What I was trying to make is the point I'm trying to make, there's a 
so many other companies out there because Tesla is just the most visible example mm -hmm. that are so incredibly overvalued. So if you buy an S&P 500 index today you're, or, or broader market index, you're buying this um, uh, a basket of these companies that are, you know, that basically are tremendously overvalued. And so, so this is your high growth companies. And the reason it's happening is because investors basically, if the company is growing, they don't care how much you're paying for that, and, you know, for the growth. And I think that's that's the, that's the one big issue I see with the market today. And I was rereading uh, your newsletters prior to interviewing you, and I'm looking back to August of 2020. So things might have changed in your opinion since then. But you made a couple of comments I would like to bring up and get your opinion now. Mm -hmm. You did state, in our portfolio, we own foreign stocks. A weaker dollar means their earnings will go up in U.S. dollar terms. I agree, relative to what looks like the macro, ironically, that we brought up earlier. But if you could expound a little bit, if you got, what is it, 32, 33 holdings, and I know we spoke negatively about yeah. certain foreign stocks, potentially, but yeah. what ratio or what percentage is foreign? So I think probably, depends on the client, probably 30 to 30. 40% of the portfolio today. Is okay, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And uh, let me just, the, the, the foreign, dumb, uh, the, for, uh, the weak dollar comment. I wrote, you know, and I think this the essay you're referring to, I basically, uh, the, the point I was trying to make in the essay is that the, the, the US dollar is a reserve currency. And it's a huge, it's a significant privilege to have uh, for country, uh, privilege and responsibility to have a reserve currency. And the problem is that you, when you, when, when you are reserve currency for 50 or 60 years, you start believing that's your God given right. And you start behaving as if you are so special that no matter what you do, you're still gonna be a reserve currency. And I think, and in that essay, which was a very sad essay, by the way, I was making the point that it doesn't mean that we will, US will lose uh, reserve currency status anytime soon, but, it, but uh, the way we have behaved over the last, you, know, you can look at from our politics, but you can also look at the US balance sheet, um, most likely will lead to weaker US dollar. And, you know, and, and so that's in part why, you know, why, uh, uh, why we own foreign stocks, but we also the, like, this is where the value is as well. So European companies, a lot of European stocks have not gone anywhere for 10 years where your stock market went straight, straight up. And I think also from that same newsletter, apparently I liked it. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of a longer, and this one will take a little more complex to unpack. Gold is hedging us against two scenarios a weaker US dollar and the debasement of all currencies. The dollar declines, but so do other currencies. Dollar outflows will be looking for homes. Some will flow into euros, British pounds, Swiss francs, and some into gold, an incorruptible asset. I like the statement. If you could unpack that a little bit for us now that it's four or five months later. Yeah, so the, yeah, it requires a preface. So if you read my essays from three, five, in 10 years ago, I would have said that I would have been very negative on gold. Not, not negative, negative is not the right word. I would have been indifferent to gold. Right. Okay, so, um, so the, basically uh, gold is a story. Currencies are a story in general, like me, you know, right? Because the currencies don't exist in nature. There's no, no such a thing. It's a, it's a story that the U.S. dollar, you learn about U.S. dollar when you go to, you know, when you go with your parents to a store and they, you know, take out $5 of the wallet and pay, buy milk. That's a story, that's a, that's a story that we are told since we're very little and we observe it. And that's why we believe in currencies. Gold is a less popular story than currencies in general, like just than traditional currencies. But it's this, you know, but it, it's a well accepted one as well. Uh, and my argument today would be that, like as I, as I mentioned before, I feel U.S. You know, we you know, we abused our privilege of of uh, of, of the you know of a reserve currency, 
and there will be price to pay for that. The only problem is every time I say this, I'm asking my, you know, when you deal with currencies, you have to always follow up with the question against what? So we behave responsibly, but then you look at, you know, across the pond and you look at the European countries, a lot of them are doing worse or the same or worse. And therefore, at some point, you know, so the gold, you know, it's very difficult to increase supply of gold. And, you know, and therefore that scarcity, what may drive, you know, its price when you have basically every, you know, every country is making promises, every, every, every government is making promises to its citizens that it doesn't keep. And that's, it. so that's, you're gonna have inflation. So let me just, as much time has been talking about this, this is our 5% position, our gold is a 5% position through options that we own. And so I'm not even, my commitment to gold on a, from a portfolio construction perspective, we have a 1% position through call options on a GLG. So it's just a hedge, that's all it is. Of course, I'm gonna read a quote from Warren Buffett. Of course, the Warren Buffett. Your goal as an investor should simply be to purchase at a rational price, a part interest in an easily understandable business where earnings are virtually certain, that's a little complicated, to be materially higher five, 10 and 20 years from now. That is an awesome paragraph, easily understandable, including the companies, but there's important things to consider that some of it we just don't know, mainly technological disruption and business threats. So, and Warren Buffett would be probably the person who would tell you stay out of gold. And and then and, 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 by the way, so I made the case for gold, and I would what I would argue is that the the reason I never touched gold until this year is because you have like uh, when, you, when you and I debate Microsoft stock or any stock for that matter, even Tesla, we can be, we can objectively talk about companies' earnings, earnings power, et cetera. So we can, there's a way to value them at least. This gold, it's a, it's a very difficult to value. So um, that's why until this year, I never touched gold. So I, I just think this, you know, the pandemic has changed the dynamics when we start, like when in one year, like during the financial crisis, I think US has a, the bailout was $800 billion and we, everybody was up in arms. Now we're talking about in trillions of dollars. We're talking about $6 trillion bailout as if it doesn't matter. So anyway, so that's, that's I'm not sure if I'm answering your question though. So I, Well, I mean, I have so many different questions. We should probably, and I want to be mindful of your time. I'm going to check into that now. We're 10 minutes before the top of the hour. Can mm -hmm. I have until 10 minutes after the top of the hour, 20 sure. more minutes? Sure. Okay. Uh, it, it, I forgot who said it, it might've been Munger, but it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price. I'm assuming you agree. Sometimes, how do you know the difference? <laughs> well, I think this is, this is why investing is not a science, but an art, right? And, For sure. And I think, the, uh, I think this is where the judgment comes in. Um, I, listen, I think the, the Buffett has made probably the best definition of high quality company. Imagine when you're analyzing a company that the after you buy it, stock market is closed for the next 10 years. Would you still have buy the, you know, would you still, you know, if you if you comfortably buying this company, not worrying about the next 10 years, then it's a quality company. That's just a because, and I think this is, I think this attitude is very important. And the reason it's important because in the stock market, this instant liquidity, a lot of times uh, turns you from an investor into a kind of, uh, into a gambler. And mm -hmm. uh, this attitude that we, you know, you're gonna buy it and then you can't sell it for 10 years, that puts you back in the shoes of a businessman or an investor. Like in other words, you'd be buying this company as you are not just buying again, going back to the piece of paper, not as a piece of paper, but a business. So that's, so I'm not answering your question. I'm not giving you exactly what does it mean in a precise, discrete terms quality company, but a quality mm -hmm. company would be the one that you would be uh, willing to own for, you know, be comfortable owning for 10 years if you could not sell it. We mentioned it earlier, the great mm -hmm. Benjamin Graham, 
Mm -hmm. was big on always invest with a margin of safety. And you did pound upon that, rightfully so, mm -hmm. about 10, 15 minutes ago. Uh, to you, is that simply limiting your portfolio, uh, limiting your acts, your your uh, what you have of that company in a portfolio? Are there other metrics specifically that you look at to for you to provide a margin of safety? So about five years ago, we made a decision, which actually, and that's gonna answer your previous question a little bit more, mm -hmm. that we only gonna buy high quality stocks. And the reason for that, because the if you buy a marginal business, the marginal businesses, uh, the the chain. Um, if you buy a melting ice cube, the melting ice cubes tend to melt faster now than ever before. And so, we made a decision that for us quality is absolute. So in other words, if we finalize the company, and we find that say doesn't meet our threshold of quality. I don't care what the price is. I move forward. I, you know, yeah, I, I brush it aside. And I think, so you get protected. As an investor, you get protected by several factors. You get protected by margin of safety, but you also get protected by quality. If I want mm -hmm. high quality business, then when you go through a pandemic like we're going through today, those businesses you know, will survive just fine. And then also if companies has a, if you overpaid a little bit for its companies, you know, for you know, for the company, if the company is growing earnings, that growth is going to bail you out at some point. I've been thinking about some of these things for a while, especially during the pandemic. And ironically, just this week, and I'm a big fan of her work. She has been on the show. Lynn Alden came out with something and some commentary. I want to share it in a probably a more of a question format to you. Uh, if we strip away the high-tech veneer, have we been in a 12-year mild depression here in the US? I ask you that, Vitaly. So depression from, you mean from the stock price performance or from the economic performance? Uh, Probably more from the economic performance. Stripping away the high-tech. Uh, you know what, actually, I don't know. I, I got to think about this because I, I, I- I'll give a little more context because it, it builds up a little bit of steam. Uh, since 2008, the number of homeless people has skyrocketed, skyrocketed. Look at San Francisco. Life expectancy in the US has not increased in the last seven or eight years where it has in other countries, often caused by the uptick in deaths of despair. But I think really the bigger one is, and I'm going to read, those of us in the U.S. that work in technology, finance, healthcare, and government, we've done extremely well. While many folks involved in manufacturing and certain other sectors think what we may call the flyover states here in the U.S., and we've seen this during the political challenges we've had, uh, they're economically displaced. It's been very, very hard for them. And I think when she made that comment, that basically is the heart of what she was trying to get at. And I would agree with that, as sad as that commentary is. No, I think that there's there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, I'm not sure, like, like, I'm not sure I could label it as depression, you know, but, but it's a definitely the discrepancy between, you know, the dispersion between haves and have nots have increased. And I think a lot of it has to do with the, the skill set that is required. So the, and I think it's only going to get worse, right? Because the automa um, and the automation, you know, the, I, I don't know, let's, let's go back 40, 50 years. You know, there was a, and it's all, you know, like when you look, uh, when you old, watch old movies, you see this uh, uh, American corporations have these huge rooms of, and they're within the, and you have there. You always have, you had hundreds of women who are sitting and typing, and it's always were women. I'm just this is so. And then you had a you know uh, then you had a uh, Xerox come out with a copy machine, and suddenly all these women became unemployed, right? So the skill that the skill of typing, you know, been basically displaced by one copy machine that takes less space than you know, my office here. Um, so yeah, I 
think, yes, so the progress has been extremely disruptive and manual labor became, became got commoditized much faster than ever before. And I, you know, and I, yes, the, the so, so yes, the dispersion between haves and have nots has, has increased, but I, I'm not sure how much value I can add there as an investor, really, to just, you know, to the discussion. Yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a deep question. We could do a full podcast about, uh, I have a couple of more questions left. One of them is going to be a very deep subject that we're probably going to need to limit to in the essence of time to three or four minutes. And I agree with it. And I take it from your writing, talking about effectively the U.S. and China. Some of your comments, what oil is for Saudi Arabia, data is to China. And then in one of your newsletters, you do a very eloquent and deep dive into 5G. I also agree with you on some of your thoughts on semiconductors. So we're going into a complex subject that requires another one hour podcast that I want you to cover your opinion in probably just two or three minutes. Uh, so the, yes, so yeah, but, so if you basically we are, the world is breaking up into two camps, the kind of Western camp of technology and kind of Chinese centric, Chinese centric camp of technology. And we are entering into the cold war of technology. And you can, you can, see, you can see this clearly, right? The, the US is basically the, the so the, as, I'm, you know, as, as you could quote it, mean, basically data, um, data is becoming more and more important. And an example in, um, is more and more important and companies that control technologies will be able to control data. And uh, therefore, uh, you basically gonna have a, the both, uh, both US and Europe together and China trying to dominate the space. And uh, that creates its own uh, new risks that we haven't seen before. And I think this is where, as, a, as an investor in technology stocks or an investor period, you have to be extremely aware of underwater rocks that may potentially exist. Um, so I'm, it's very like, uh, Angela, it's incredibly difficult to summarize a six page article in four minutes. So I'm, right. str I'm struggling here a little bit, but I, I like, and I'm saying this just because it's a, it took me weeks to write that article, but I would go to uh, contrarianedge.com and read that article because I think it just, yeah, I would do disservice to your listeners. You know. it, it was probably my favorite of your work this year. So I highly encourage that as well. Uh, you do talk a little bit about defensive stocks and you mentioned some names to potentially yeah. look at. And I believe that was also part of the same newsletter if I'm remembering yeah. correctly. Yeah. Uh, it's always sometimes a sensitive subject for people, but I think it certainly would endear to the audience if you could maybe highlight a company that to you, whether they're in your portfolio or not, yeah. uh, in terms of why you made the decision either in or out of as a value investment, and what is that company? <laughs> yeah, so, so let's let's look. Uh, I'll give you one company, and that falls right perfectly into the in the defense sector. So, we uh, bought a company called Huntington Ingalls. It's a symbol sure. H, H A I, and it's basically the sole maker of aircraft carriers in the United States and that they have a duopoly position in making submarines in the United States. So it's them and General Dynamics. So we, by the way, we own both companies, we own General Dynamics as well. Um, and this is a company where their backlog, they have a, you know, they have a backlog, I, I'm just gonna make up a number. I don't remember it right away you know, from the top of my head, but it's about $45 billion, which is about next seven, or, I forget, seven or eight years of revenues. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as the world is becoming less safe place, I look at defense companies in general as, as a, basically there is a, the anti-fragile, like if, the world gets, uh, if the world gets less safe, they benefit from this. And I'm not wishing for the world to become less safe, but the world will do what it does. Um, and so, you know, you know, when we buy this company, we're basically paying our eight or nine times earnings for company whose earnings will continue to grow. 
Google or Facebook or whoever is not going to displace them. And it's a basically either monopoly or duopoly. Mm-hmm. And that has a, you know, that has a customer that's not going to go anywhere. And that has very high recurrence of revenues that had a great balance sheet. And also at the time, you know, because they made a lot of investments in the, uh, in the, uh, in the in the uh, in the factories of previous uh, seven years, their capital expenditures would decline, and therefore their free cash flow will be will grow at a faster rate than revenues. So that's you know that's kind of like you know I can buy them, and if I get for the next ten years, I don't have to worry about you know, and I can sleep well at night. So that's a but the the reason opportunity was there and it's still there somewhat because these kind of companies were inconvenienced by the virus. When you make submarines, it's a lot more difficult to do social distancing when you make them. And so, so therefore, that business hasn't really changed, but for the duration of the virus became less profitable. Okay, and therefore, at some, at some point as the virus is in a rear view mirror, their earnings power will come back to what it was before. And I would argue probably gonna be higher because the world is less safer today than it was, uh, you know, than, than it was before. That's an excellent analysis and I would concur. Uh, probably only two more questions left. Vitaly, you know you're not gonna get out of a one hour podcast talking about the world, about investing, and then mentioning gold and not having Bitcoin come up, come on. I do not know your opinion, my audience knows mine. And by the way, although I have some concerns, I'm an advocate. Uh, we're not here to debate Bitcoin, but I want to give you the floor, whether it's 30 seconds, 10 seconds, two minutes, your opinion about Bitcoin. I, like, I don't know. Like, I, 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 it's, there are so many, like, I, like, it's one of those things where I almost like don't want to have an opinion because it's a, like, I'm not sure how valuable that is. Um, I know that it's a story, like you know, in the context of the framework we talked before about the story, right? Mm-hmm. In the, just like gold is a story, Bitcoin is a story that is becoming more and more accepted. And what's what's interesting? So this is the positive side, is that now you can actually buy, you know, Bitcoin on PayPal and some other places. The more places you can buy it, the more it's going to get accepted. But that's so that's a positive thing, but then but the negative ones are there are so many too because is that the cryptocurrency? Because it's not a very good one. I mean, it's a, in the sense that like uh, when I pay with a Visa Mastercard, Visa can process I don't know some thousands of transactions uh, transactions a second. Bitcoin as a technology is not there. Then is that so? Is that the fu- is that the future currency or some other currencies? Would be the ones. Is it Ethereum? Is it Litecoin or whatever? So, I don't, so you have to make that decision when you uh, uh, when you analyzing yeah when you analyzing Bitcoin. So I look at that, and I basically say, like if you and I and actually I have to agree with Bill Miller on this, where if you take a tiny position of this for its optionality, fine. Just like like without gold position. I committed 1% of the portfolio that, you know, that had a notional value of five, and that is my exposure to gold. If you put, I don't know, a basis points of position in Bitcoin. I, I, on CME. I'm sorry? You could do futures of Bitcoin on the CME and soon to be Ethereum. That yeah, will help but, the institutional but, investor. Yeah, but futures work both ways. So that's, you know. Of course. A, yeah, so I, um, <laughs> so, my, my, so that that is basically the extent of my thinking on Bitcoin. So it's a kind of it's a very wishy washy answer because it's a wishy washy thinking. So that's yeah. yeah, that's an honest opinion. And like you said, maybe a tiny percentage for some people. Where if it goes all to smoke, it's not going to destroy your portfolio. I have deeper feelings about it, but this is not the forum to discuss that. We've done enough on Bitcoin and more to come. We don't need to make it the core focus of our discussion today. I see amazing art behind you, and I understand from being a fan of yours and reading your newsletters, but for those that may not be familiar, if you could talk a little bit about uh, your dad and the importance of art for you and your family. Uh, so yeah, so my, so my, my father is, a, uh, is an you know, uh, taught, uh, electrical engineer for 30 years. And since he was five or six years old, he painted. And uh, you know, when we lived in Russia, painting was his hobby. 
and when he moved to the United States, it's a, he was almost 60 years old, so he couldn't really teach anymore. So he just embraced painting as a full-time you know, profession. And for a while, he actually made a living and then he stops, you know, then he stopped. Uh, uh, not you know, just because he decided that he wants to keep uh, all his art in the family. So he's, you know, and uh, so I, the way I look at this is that life is too short if you just focus on investing. And that's why in my newsletters, I talk about, you know, my, you know kind of I, I, wanted, I wanted the world to see my father's art. So that's why I showcase him in my newsletters. But I also talk about life. And I also talk about classical music because I love it too. So it's a, uh, that's how I guess the, my father's paintings made into, into, my, into my articles and newsletters. I think it's amazing or beautiful and I've really enjoyed it. And I was gonna bring up very briefly music as well. I know that's been very important to you. Mm -hmm. I'm just interested when you're thinking, meditating, mm -hmm. uh, analyzing stocks, do you have classical music on in the background? Yes, yeah, so I have a, yeah. So when I write, I always listen to classical music and I put my headphones on. And if I'm really stuck, I'm listening to Bach or opera, <laughs> but I, but I, you know, like Spotify, you know, creates this playlist based on your previous. Yes, past. they do. And so I, a lot of times I listen to this playlist and this is how I discover new music, new, new music. And this is why every member of my family has their own Spotify account. And I, beg my kids not to use mine because then I'll be using to, I'll be, I'll be listening to whatever rap my son is listening to. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have them set up their own password and use their own. Yeah. Uh, for those that are interested in learning more about how they could subscribe, which I highly recommend to your newsletter or learn more about from an investing perspective, how they could potentially uh, with a separately managed account, et cetera. I'll start by, I'm going to spell your name to the audience. V-I-T-A-L-I-Y and last name K-A-T-S-E-N-E-L-S-O-N. Vitali, how could they learn more? So, you know, the, you know I just realized the beauty of having a, my first name and last name, chances of another Vitalik at Nelson being around are very low, but good. So, so, so <laughs> Google will give you the right result. Um, so the, if you want to read my articles, and I would encourage you to get them by email because then you'll get my father's artwork, my personal mm -hmm. stories, and everything else is in one package. You go to Contrarian Edge, uh, E-D-G-E, Contrarian E-D-G-E dot com. You can read my articles there and you can subscribe to them. We also have a podcast, which is kind of a, you know, not, Angel, it's not as good as your podcast because oh, it's just- Oh, please, it's better. <laughs> it's, a, it's a basically, it's, a, it's just really someone else reads my articles to you. And, uh, you know, so if you're driving in the car and you just, you know, you don't have time to, you know, to read my articles, you can listen to them. And it's an investor.fm, like a FM radio. And finally, if you want to learn about my firm, you can go to IMA, USA.com, IMAUSA.com. And so those are probably three best places to go to. And when is your next upcoming book? When is it coming out? So, yeah, so the, I'm, uh, it's uh, coming out of, uh, sometime late spring, early summer. And it's called? Um, it's called, you're probably the first person to know the name, actually. It's going to be called Soul in the Game. Oh, I love it. Excellent. Uh, well, I highly recommend that people engage and reach out. I love your stuff. And it was a pleasure to have you on today. In concluding, everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of the Angelo Robles podcast. And I'm the founder and CEO at Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to family offices. We do a tremendous amount of original content. We're extremely active hosting physical events, a little bit more cramped now because of COVID, of course. Uh, although we have done a couple of roundtables very discreetly and very carefully, but we host hundreds of virtual programming. And especially in 2021, 
lots of variations of it that is going to be very engaging specifically for our members. I recommend in social or on social media, probably my YouTube is my most interactive or simply family office, go and subscribe. And to learn more about the company and potentially to become a member, very simply familyofficeassociation.com. And my direct email is angelo at familyofficeassociation.com. Vitaly, thank you so much. Our live audience, thank you. Look forward to next time. Angelo, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.